All right, so this evening, 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to be teaching on uh, the uh, communion, or am I teaching on hair, right? It's kind of the two choices you get. It's divided almost in half, and uh, I am preaching on the latter, not the former. So uh, this evening, the title of my sermon is, Does God Care About Your Hair? And... You know, if you talk to people who are not Christians, don't believe the Bible, it might sound like kind of a silly question. And even people who claim to be Christian, you know, it might just sound like, well, why in the world would God care about my hair? Like, like, aren't there deeper things? Doesn't God just care about my soul and my spirit and my intentions and things like that? And look, the, the subject matter for tonight about your hair, I'll say this right off the bat. This is not the most important thing that you need to know from the Bible. But this is in the Bible. And it can very easily be answered. I mean, the, the title of my sermon is a question, Does God Care About Your Hair? Well, we just got done reading all of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Can anyone reasonably just say, nope? Nope, he doesn't care. I mean, honestly, can, can you just say no? We, we literally just saw verses talking about your hair. We're going to go in this in depth. Don't worry. We're going we're to dig into these passages. But to say no is just folly. It's, it's very clear that God does care. But what's, what matters, though, is why, right? Why does God care? What's the meaning behind it? It seems very superficial to us, and maybe many people might think, well, why? I don't think that God should care about that at all. Why? It's so trivial. Well, he does, and we're going to get to why in just a minute. And I also want to mention this, too. This is one of those subjects that people can really freak out about and get really angry about. And I'll tell you this much. The only people who get really angry about these sermons are the people who are not really in compliance with what the Bible teaches about this. So the goal with this, as with all of our sermons is to let you know, hey, God does care about these things. Here's what the Bible teaches. And if you're not in compliance, then there you go. This is what it says. It's up to you to choose. Am I going to receive this? Am I going to receive correction if it's needed? Now, um, I don't know. Like, I had zero people in. I'm not thinking like, oh, man, I'm going to get so-and-so with this sermon. And honestly, I don't think that way about the sermons I preach, okay? If there's ever a sermon uh, taught or preached here that you may be guilty of, just be glad that you have someone that's going to not withhold what the Bible says because to me it matters more. And I know when I was in the other position sitting in the pews, I always wanted to hear, and I still do want to hear things that I need to correct because I want to be right with God, right? So if we were able to say, does God care about your hair? No, great, let's move on. But it's kind of listed here in Scripture for half a chapter, not to mention some other places we're going to look at as well. So we do have to deal with this, and God, God does care. If he didn't care, it simply wouldn't even be referenced at all in his word. So... I think this is enough to say, does God care? Yes. But let's dig into this a little bit more, and, let, and let's just see what we could learn uh, from this this evening. I was actually a little surprised when I looked back to see when was the last time I taught on this. It's been a really long time since I dedicated a sermon to this subject. Um, and, and here's the other thing, too. People freak out about this, and last week I preached uh, on clothing a little bit, right? I think it was who wears the pants. So these are both subjects that people get really angry about, like just really livid. But they're some of the easiest things to fix. <laughs> so if you get really angry over something like this, just ask yourself, why am I so angry? Like, do you just have to cleave to something so much or not? I mean, the, the good thing is about like your hair you just either don't do anything and let your hair grow if that's where you should be, or you just get a haircut if that's where you, you know, like whichever one it is, whether it's long or short, hey, that's done. And once you get that taken care of, like you're good. You're good to go. Same thing with how you dress. It's just like, okay, well, I'm either going to wear pants or I'm going to wear skirts and dresses. Like easy, 
right? It's not, it shouldn't be something super complicated. You know, the harder things to deal with are the things that are like in your heart and other, other lusts and sins and things that, 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 pl that could be more plaguing than just like this external appearance stuff. External appearance stuff is simple. Change your wardrobe. Get a haircut or not, right? <laughs> Just, uh, like, like done, right? Check off the box. Look, I got this taken care of. So these, this should be an easy win for anyone who is not in compliance with what the scripture says. Now, let's dig into this, try to nail this down a little bit, get some understanding and see what the Bible is actually teaching about this. Verse number one, be followers of me even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Now, he starts off giving us an authority structure. When it's talking about the head, it's not the physical head, right? The head of the man, the Bible says every man, his head is Christ. That means his boss. Amen. Who is his authority? Who is his superior? Who is he answering to? He's answering to Christ. And then it says, and the head of the woman is the man. Ladies, I didn't write the Bible. I hope you believe the Bible. And this is what the Bible says, right? Before you freak out, what do you mean? You think men are better than women. No, I don't. And this, as true as this verse is, I don't think men are better than women. There's an authority structure. There is. I don't think that the governor is better than me. I don't. But there's an authority structure. I don't think that my boss at work is better than me. I think we're equal. You know, we're, we're people. It's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a better than in, in the value system. But there's authority that you operate under. And God is designating here, this is the authority. Okay, he made man, he made woman. And, it, you know, there's, there's plenty of passages that talk about this. And as we get into this, and I'm spending enough time on this, that you understand that the hair is representative of this authority structure. And that's what's going to be related to back and forth as we get into this. And this is why it's so important. So uh, when it says the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So the father is head of the son. I thought they're both God. They are both God. But even within the triune God, there's an authority structure there. And, you know, hey, great is the mystery of godliness when God was manifest in the flesh. But at the same time, you know, there is, a, a, there is an order. And you have three persons in the Godhead. Now, this sermon is about the Trinity, so I want to really dig into that uh, in depth. But this is what the Bible is teaching that's a fact. It's a fact. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So verse 4, very clearly it's saying, hey, if you're praying or prophesying as a man and you have your head covered, you're doing a dishonor to your head. And that's why he just established who the heads are, because he's not saying like somehow your physical head is dishonored. Brother Jared, you'll appreciate the sermon. This isn't about you. But <laughs> Brother Jared had, had, had an interesting time last week. Was it last week? At the, at the, at the hair place. Because they, they, they made a mistake and dishonored his head. <laughs> so so he, his hair had to go a little bit shorter than he was intending on. But hey, I like the, I like the cut, man, dude. I, I think you should keep it. That's, I, I think it's good. But... Um, this isn't talking about that type of dishonoring where someone, you know, screws up with the clippers and, and you've dishonored my head. What are you doing, right? This is dishonoring the head who is the boss. So the Bible's teaching here that every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. And who's the head of the man? Christ. So when you have your head covered, the Bible's clearly saying, well, you're dishonoring Christ if you're a man. And then it says, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. And who's her head? The man. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now, I'm going to deal with this right off the bat so I don't have to come back to this later. 
people have a weird interpretation of this passage just because it uses the word covered, uncovered, covering. But the context of the passage itself very clearly explains what that covering is. And because of this word cover being used, this is where a lot of even traditions come from, where, you know, if, if people were to say a prayer, if a, man, if a man's got a baseball cap on, he's going to be like, oh, wait, no, I got to take this off before I can pray. Now, look, I don't care if you do that. Like, that doesn't matter to me. And if the culture shows, because you, could, you can make this argument, too, that having your hat on when you eat or having your hat on when you walk into someone's house or something like that, if that's disrespectful, if the culture is kind of saying that, then it probably is a good idea to do it anyways. But it's not what the Bible's teaching right here. Okay, the covering isn't a hat. And similarly for the, for the women, you know, that's where you see some churches will have ladies wearing the bonnets, right? And, and they'll have their head covered. And it's, it's a misunderstanding of this passage right here as to why they do that. And if you go to a church where like almost every lady is, got, is wearing a hat in service, it's because they don't understand this passage and probably they're not saved. And I'm not saying that, oh, you have to know this in order to be saved. No, you don't. You don't have to be right on this doctrine. But it's such a fundamental flaw in understanding that, like, you, if you can't understand that this is talking about your hair, you probably don't have the Holy Spirit guiding you into this truth at all because it's so basic and so elemental and even in the context here. Now, people are going to probably take, try to take that out of context. Say, Pastor Burton says if you don't believe this, you're not saved. I'm not what I'm saying. But the churches that practice this stuff, their doctrine proves that they're not saved. Seventh-day Adventists, the uh, Mennonites, right? Some Mennonites practice this. Amish -practice will practice this stuff. They all believe in work salvation. You could lose your salvation. They believe totally wrong on this stuff. And there's other sects, too. It doesn't matter. If you walk into these churches, you see almost all ladies wearing these bonnets and stuff. 99.9% .9 chance that they're not saved, okay? But if you look down, so we're looking at this covering. Verse number 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. There is our definition of what's being talked about as a covering, the hair. The hair is given as a covering. And the woman is supposed to have her hair covered. And God gave her a covering and says, it's the hair. Which is also why, as we continue to go through this, it's comparing uncovered with shaven and shorn. You don't shave a hat. You shave hair. If your head's shorn, it's not like, oh, you're not wearing a hat today. You know what I mean? It's because it's, it's, it's cut really short. So I just wanted to address that real quick just because that false doctrine's out there, but let's dig into this and just get some more of the real understanding and the meat of this passage because that's just kind of, to me, it's just silliness that people even believe that. It's so clear from the context. So every man praying and prophesying, having his head covered, dishonored with his head, we already saw a covering is the hair. And that this, isn't, this doesn't mean that every man has to be bald. Okay, we'll get into this in a little bit. It's like, well, yours is covered, Pastor Burzins, because you have hair. No. Let's keep going. Every woman that prayed the prophet with her head uncovered to sign with her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. So right away we see it clearly isn't shaven if she's uncovered because it says it's as if she were shaven. So you could be uncovered considered to be uncovered, you're having your head uncovered as a woman, without it being completely shaven. Right? Makes sense? Otherwise, this verse wouldn't make any sense, because how could it be like that um, if it already automatically is that? Verse 6, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. It's like, well, if you're not going to be covered, then you might as well just go ahead and be shorn. It's like, just go all in. Right? Be hot or cold. I mean, if you, if you want to have the short hair, if you don't really want to have your head covered, then just go right ahead and have it shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. 
For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. So going back to the authority, to, to who it is that you're glorifying, well, the man is supposed to glorify Christ, and he's saying, you know, the, Bible's teaching, the Bible teaches that man was made in the image of God, but woman was made from man, right? So when Adam was made, he was made in the image of God. Well, if we're not supposed to have our head covered, does that mean that God's head is covered? Or Jesus' head is covered? No. Covered meaning long hair. And as we'll see in a minute, even more clearly, the long hair Jesus image is false. Amen. It's a lie. It's not true. Because we also know from Scripture that Jesus was without sin. So, it's kind of hard for him to have this long hair if clearly the Bible is teaching here otherwise. Was, was it, let me ask you this. In any way, was Jesus a dishonor to the Father? <laughs> I think the Bible teaches he did always those things which please the Father. So if he's covering his head as a man, is that pleasing his head, which is the Father? No. No. Which would then cause a contradiction in Scripture. But the woman, on the other hand, she's the image, she's the, the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. And I think what we can see here is the value is still the same. Men come from women, women, you know, like, like there's this, there's this, whether you're a man or a woman, like the Bible says, there's neither male nor female in Christ. The value is all equal. Men come from women. All men have moms, right? And a woman was made for the man. But it, that's, so it's not a matter of, of who's better. But it's a matter of who is your authority and then how do you respect and honor and glorify that authority. For as the woman is, verse 12, uh, is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? And then verse 14 is kind of key here. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Now, this is a question, and we don't always base, you know, we don't base doctrines on just questions alone, but the context of this passage is already confirming that the answer is yes, it is a shame, and that nature does teach us this. Now, I have an article that I'm going to read for you that I found online from Time Magazine. Secular, worldly, I did this last week when we were looking at clothing. The Bible is making the claim, doesn't even nature teach this to you? Well, if nature teaches this to you, you don't even have to have God telling you flat out that it's wrong. For right. God instilled in us a conscience and a sense of right and wrong. And some things, I mean, like, does anyone really have to tell anyone else that murder is just wrong? Right. Just first degree, cold-blooded murder, yeah, that's wrong. Amen. You don't need God to make a commandment in order to know that that's wrong because he's already put that in our hearts naturally as a human being. Amen. But the Bible is teaching us that even this concept of women having long hair and men having short hair is also built in naturally. And if this is true, what I would expect to see is that this is the way things have always been. Now, it doesn't mean that there weren't shameful societies. It doesn't mean that there's not sinners out there that just disregard the natural instinct that this is a shame. 
But we will see the trend of women having long hair and men having shorter hair. And this is exactly what we see throughout history. And in fact, this is also what you see with children who haven't been taught anything. But if you, you know, when, when children confuse a woman and a man based on the length of their hair, it's shameful for whoever is being misgendered, whether it's the man or the woman. So you got a dude with long hair who's like walking, you know, and letting his hair flow. He's doing the chicken walk or whatever. And then you got some, some kid behind him. He's like, excuse me, ma'am. It's like, whoa. And he's like, got a full beard or something. It's kind of a shame for that guy to be called a woman. Right? Not because women are inferior, but just it's a shame to be called a woman when you're a man, just like it's a shame for a woman to be called a man when she's a woman. Right? When you got, you got to the super tight, you know, like buzz cut. It's like, excuse me, sir. And they turn around. It's like, whoa. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's shameful, right? No one, wa no one wants that to happen when you're, when you're being, well, these days, I don't know, people want all kinds of weird things, but it, it, it's, it's not right, and it's easy to tell, and you don't have to teach kids, hey, girls have long hair, and men have short hair. They already instinctively know. They do. And I'll read this article for you. This is totally secular and totally worldly, but this actually speaks completely to the point of what the Bible teaches. Now, they're going to talk about it like, oh, it's kind of a mystery, or you know, like, like it's just sort of this interesting thing. But the Bible already tells us the answers on these things. L just let's listen to this. It says, though, though hair fashions may change season to season, the association between women and long hair is an ancient one. It's ancient. It dates back to at least to ancient Greeks and Romans, and according to archaeologist Elizabeth Bartman, even despite the ancient Greek ideal of a bearded, long-haired philosopher, which, okay, a long-haired philosopher, that's not right according to the Bible, but listen to this, so they say, that's their ideal, you have a bearded, long-haired philosopher, women in that society still had longer hair than men regularly did. So even when they had men with long hair, it's like the women were still trying to differentiate and have the longer hair than the long-haired man would have who's a philosopher. You know, the Bible says to uh, avoid the, the philosophies, right, philosophy of men. Um, and so what if the Greeks had that code? But it's just interesting here to see that they're still drawing a distinction that the women would still have longer hair. Roman women kept their hair long and, t and tended to part it down the center. And a man devoting too much attention to his hair risked scorn for appearing effeminate. Imagine that. Thousands of years ago, a man that just cares too much about his hair is going to be considered effeminate. Isn't that the same today? Look, I know it was for me growing up, even just in school, away from any churches, away from any other thing. You got some pretty boy who's got his hair all perfect and stuff. Even if it's not that long, it's just kind of like, dude, what's the matter with you, man? Why do you care so much about how your hair looks? Why does it take you an hour to get ready? You're like a woman. It's effeminate. Because women care a lot more about their appearance than men do. So this, and this apparently has held true over time. The Bible carried on the tradition. The Bible carried on the tradition. No, God says what's right and wrong, but okay. It's a secular source, right? Anthony Sinat, a sociologist who has written that hair, listen, this, hair is a personal symbol with immense social significance. And this is the world. And, and look, I do believe this is true, that your hair does have immense social significance. It's something that, that, speaks about you when you're out in the world and by looking at people you can start to you could you could understand a little bit about who they are based on their haircut to some degree it could put you into certain categories right off the bat it says uh hair is a personal symbol with immense social significance found these implications in for example saint paul's letter to the corinthians 
and it quotes this verse, doth not nature, oh, it kind of, it almost quotes this verse, doth not nature, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair is a shame unto him, but if a woman have long hair is a glory to her. That's what it says here. I think it left out even, but um, continuing on with this article, it says it is almost universally culturally found that women have longer hair than men, says Kurt Sten, author of Hair, A Human History. Almost universally culturally found. And like I said, of course you're going to have people who are just going to live however they want, just completely in contradiction to even what's naturally considered a shame, right? Because I think it's also naturally considered a shame for, for homos to do homo things. And I think that's just built in, too, that when, when parents have kids who turn out to be homos, they're ashamed of their kids. And that when you're around someone who's identifying to be a homo, it's kind of a shame and embarrassment. You don't have anything to do with them because it's disgusting and filthy, and you just know what's wrong inherently. Amen. Just like, like I said, when I was a kid, unsaved, in the world, we would call those people fags. And no one wanted to be a fag or associated with a fag because you knew it was weird and twisted and just you want nothing to do with them. We played a game called Smear the Queer. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Amen. All right. Yes. And that was natural. You just knew that that's weird. And the effeminate guy is going to get made fun of. So here's what they say now, continuing on this article. But the reasons why that tradition started out and why it has endured are harder to pin down. It's actually not hard to pin down. It's because it's the way God created us. Amen. It's that simple. God created us naturally to know this thing. Yep. But for them, it's complicated. It is hard when, when you don't have God to try to figure out the reason for things. Yeah. It then becomes extremely difficult. Hair is highly communicative says Sten, allowing individuals to send messages of health, sexuality, religious, religiosity, power on first glance. So all these different things are being transmitted through your hair is what this person is saying, what this uh, uh, scholar is saying about these things. It can be an expression of individual and group identity. And the more attention a person, in parentheses, often a woman, is expected to devote to it, the more it can say. So the more people invest in it, the, the, more, the more messages they're trying to get out about their hair is basically what that's saying. So you really invest a lot of time in it. Mostly women will do this. It, it's, it's transmitting more information about you. The scholar, Deborah Pergament, has written that hair's cultural and historic implications can be legally significant. Inferences and judgments about a person's morality, sexual orientation, political persuasion, religious sentiments, and in some cultural socioeconomic status, she notes, can sometimes be sur surmised by seeing a particular hairstyle. So even before I just continue with the rest of this article, I, I hold that these things are true, what's being, what's being stated here. Like, I, I'm not disagreeing with, with the main sentiment of what's being said here. And I think the reason why I'm even bringing this up, if all of these things are true and it's being, this stuff is being transmitted, it's not that hard to figure out why God cares about your hair. Yeah. Right. right? I mean, if, if you're able to communicate a lot of this stuff through your hairstyle... Well, these have a lot deeper meanings and are more important things than just like, well, do I part to the left or to the right? You know, like that's not the, that's not what it's, it, it's, it's, it's it goes a lot deeper than that. I'll finish off this article here real quick. Sten also notes the practical difficulties of long hair. In order to have long hair, you have to have your needs in life taken care of. And this is where it kind of culminates when I was just like, man, this is so spot on. It says, in order to have long hair, you have to have your needs in life taken care of. So long hair is also a status symbol, especially when it comes to complex hairstyles that require someone else to help you do them. Which, 
implies you have the wealth to do it. It's no coincidence, and this is the key point. Now look, we'll get to that a little bit later. Extravagant hairstyles on women is also not okay. In I mean, it's, just, it's not what we should be focused on. Okay, what we'll get to that later. The Bible teaches against that, against this extravagant, luxurious hairstyle that you have to have, like other people you know, show this status symbol of how much money you have. That's also wrong, you know, and, and should not be done. But we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Just remember that that they're even saying that. Oh, look, here's this. Uh, this implies you have the wealth to do it. But listen to this, it's no coincidence that short hairstyles like the bob came into fashion during the 20th century. 20th century. In regions where women were beginning to push back against the idea that they needed to be taken care of. Women's lib. What does the Bible teach? that the man ought to provide for his household, that the man needs to take care of his wife, that the, the husband needs to take care of his wife, that the father needs to take care of his children, the provider. This is a core value that's taught in Scripture, that that's the man's duty, that's the man's job, is to go out and provide for his wife. But then this wicked concept of women going, I don't need no man to take care of me. I don't need that. This all of a sudden comes out, and what happens? The hair goes short. And like this article says, it's no coincidence. It is no coincidence that the shortness of the hair is tied in to the concept of, I don't need anyone taking care of me. Because that's exactly what that's saying. That is exactly what the short hair haircut is doing. I don't need no man. I'm not, I don't, fit, I don't need to be this traditional woman. I don't need to have your, you know, no man's going to tell me what to do. What is that? A dishonor to her head. Amen. Who's her head? The man. The man. It's what the Bible's teaching. It says, even in the mid-20th century, after women with short hair were less surprising, American men and boys had to fight for their right to grow out their locks. <laughs> fight for your right to look like a woman, and here we are today. This is secular, and it's true. It's observational on what's happened throughout history. This, I mean, this is what happened. The Bible's true. This isn't, this isn't a Baptist agenda. This is calling it out for what it is. This is I'm surprised at how truthful the, the information is from a Time Magazine article just about the history of, of the length of hair. And the fact that they can draw the conclusion, hey, it's no coincidence that this lines up perfectly with the lim women's liberation movement and not wanting to be cared for by men and not wanting to have those traditional roles of men and women. That all of a sudden, bzzzt, let's make it real short. Inherently, what we're seeing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 God put this into nature. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame on him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given her for a covering. Like that's why you have the hair, ladies, is for the covering. God gave that to you and God instilled you with that understanding that this is what it's for. But this chapter ties it in deeper than just like, well, who cares really if it's long or short? Because it's showing honor and respect to your authority. It's your submission to your, your governing authority in your life, right? Now, look, everyone is subject to God, right? No, no doubt about that. But specifically, and, and, and you see this to be true. I've taught about this when, I, when I've preached sermons on music, but, but think about it. What is the spirit of rock music? Rebellion, right? Against the authority, against the man, against government, against everything. Anyone telling you what to do, rock music is just by and large against it. Is it any coincidence 
that all of the rockers, like all of them, long hair, long hair, long hair, rebellious, stubborn, against their authority, against their head, against Christ. And it's shameful. I don't care. No one's going to tell me what to do with long-haired hippies. It's that attitude of, I don't want anyone telling me what to do. You can't tell me what to do. Well, you know what? Christ could tell you what to do. Amen. And you're dishonoring your head who bought you and paid for your sins with his blood when you walk around with long hair. And the woman with short hair, it's dishonoring her head. And who's her head? The man, the husband, the father, whatever, right? That's the, the authority that's in her life. And that's what it is. No man's going to tell me what to do. I'm my own woman. I'm going to go out and do what I want to do. These attitudes are real. They exist. It, it, it should be obvious. It should be obvious that this is true. But people who don't want to make it, just don't want to accept that fact, will try to cling to anything to, to all of a sudden to, to make this not teach what it teaches. Now, look, I, I want to say this, too, because... These are, this is talking about choices and people doing things. Obviously, today, there are people who have problems. Like, for example, my mother-in-law has cancer. She's taking chemo, and her hair fell out, right? You can't control that. She's not trying to dishonor any head. It just happens, right? People have thyroid issues and other things that could physically just cause, you know, we're not talking about health problems here, right? But I just think it ought to be said that you, you, you can't just, Look on people and just judge them if, you know, if, if something's, and, and here's the thing too, you'll find this as well among many of the, especially the cancer patients who have lost their hair that are women, they do feel ashamed. Because naturally, it's, it's a shame for a woman to have her head shorn or shaven. So they're always trying to find ways to cover it up and have wigs and other things to cover it up because it's real, because it's natu a natural instinct and feeling to have that. But that doesn't mean that they're trying to dishonor their head, right? So putting aside all those weird cases where it's like, well, no, actually, this is this. This is boiling down to, look, you got a choice. Are you going to cut your hair short as a man or grow your hair long as a woman? That's up to you. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how long is long and how short is short. And I think it does that for a reason, because if you have a middle ground, if it's in exact length, you can't see the difference of like an inch, for example, or a half an inch. So in order to not have that be in there, we just have to use reasoning and reasonableness that if you were just to look at someone's, and look, if you look at the guys, everybody's got different length hair for the most, I mean, there's different types of hairstyles in here, but in general, and I don't know, like I'm not trying to point out, I don't think, I, one of the reasons I'm going in is like, I don't think there is any guys here that have like really long hair. But it's just, I mean, they look normal. Right? And, and I'm, I'm sorry, I would, I would never like, like try to point somebody out in church, but I literally, I'm saying this because I don't think there is. So if there is, you know, I'm not just trying to like call you out specifically, but I look around going like, you know what, I think it's pretty normal. Right? And, and Okay, short hair. Like, you don't have to have it as short as mine to be considered short hair. And, you know, with ladies with long hair, it doesn't have to be going down to your feet to have, to have long hair, right? There, there's there's going to be uh, this, this standard. And, and, you know, use your judgment with that. And at the end of the day, it's still going to be between you and ultimately your authority, right? Are you going to honor or dishonor your authority, your head? Well, am I going to... How much do you want to make sure that's done? And like I said, just, just decide it for yourself and be done with it and move on. Like how much do you really care and want to hold on to like a particular hairstyle or something? It's like just, just let it go. It's easier for guys, I think. I don't know, but because guys ought to really not really care that much about your hair. Like, oh, I got to have it short. All right, cool. <laughs> Fine. I mean, me, th the reason why my hair is this short, I'll, I'll let you down a secret. It's because I don't have to worry about doing anything with it. I get out of bed, and there's no bedhead. 
So like, if I'm not able to take a shower or even do anything, I don't have to worry about having some crazy piece of hair sticking up, I could just leave. Like, it's awesome, right? Because I don't care at all. Now, ladies, I understand if you care a little bit more about your hair, that's fine, right? You're a lady, but I don't care about mine. Turn, if you would, to, um, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I just want to cover this real quick. Oh, man. <laughs> well, that took a little bit longer than I thought. We're talking about men who really care a lot about their hair. That is effeminate, like that article said. When, when men, even historically, would just put a lot of effort and attention in their hair, that's effeminate. You know what? Being effeminate is a sin. So men, don't get all caught up in your hair. Ever. Okay? Now, be clean. Right? Be be, uh, uh, be able to, to, to show some, some level of like it's not just all nasty or, or you know stinks or something you know you gotta keep yourself well kept but you don't you really don't have to put much effort into it other than keeping it clean right First Corinthians 6 9 the Bible says know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abuse themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So list off all these different sins. Well, one of those sins is effeminate. And I'll just make point of this. Modern versions, they don't have effeminate as a sin listed off there. They don't. What they do is they combine effeminate with abuse themselves with mankind and just say, well, that's homosexuals. And it's not. It's not true. But I don't want to get into, like, that was something I might have gone into a little bit more depth, but I don't have time to get into that now. But being effeminate, the dictionary definition, did I write it down here? I did not write it down here. It doesn't matter. The, oh, I did. So I, I, I have a, um, I just went to, to the dictionary and pulled up a definition. Even, I mean, it's, it's not hard. You should already know what it is. But here's the definition says, of a man or a boy displaying characteristics regarded as typical of a woman, not manly. That's effeminate. That's what the word means. It has nothing to do with being a sodomite, except that maybe, I mean, we see that some sodomites are effeminate also, but being effeminate does not mean that a person is a sodomite. I've known, men, I've known guys in the past that were, you know, cared a little bit too much about some things, and they were a little effeminate. But they were not homos, right? This is something you could fix, being a little, you know, man up a little bit, right? Go out, work hard, get a little dirty. You might need to change your job or something. I don't know. Do something. <laughs> or stop eating food that's pumped with estrogen, right, these days especially, and get some, yeah, the soy boys, get some, get some testosterone flowing through your body and, and be a little bit more manly, right? You might just need that. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate because I do believe that there are, there's chemical influences that now are impacting especially the young people the young boys, to just be more effeminate. Watch out, and parents, watch out for that. Like, careful what you're feeding your family because these things do have an impact. It's something to be aware of. It's, all, it's already been scientifically proved, like things like BPA. It, it turns the frogs gay. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds funny, and if you saw the Alex Jones rant, okay, it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> like, look it up. The studies were done, okay? And, and, and just be careful with this stuff. Know that it's out there, and, and know it's a sin to be effeminate, okay? So don't raise effeminate boys. Raise them to be men. Now, all right, turn, if you would, to 2 Samuel 14. I really wanted to cover, I don't think I have enough time to cover the Nazarite vow. 
But in, in Numbers chapter 6, I'll just briefly just, just give a high-level overview. It talks about Numbers 6, if you want to do homework later, you just read all of Numbers 6. That just covers in detail the Nazarite vow. Because when people talk about length of it, well, when men have long hair, it's a shame. Then what about the Nazarite vow, huh? What about Samson, huh? What about, you know, and they want to they bring this stuff up. And the Nazarite vow is unique. And I do believe it, it, it talked about, you know, people growing out their hair. But when you read it, you understand the reasoning for it. Okay, and, and when you really dig into it, you're going to see, and you don't have to dig into it that much. When you start reading number six and start studying, just, just kind of look at it more than just a cursory reading and try to figure out what's the point of this. And the Nazarite vow are people who are separating themselves unto the Lord. So they're, they're, they're sanctifying themselves, separating themselves on purpose to like be closer to God. And at the end of this, they were going to offer up a sacrifice. And the whole point was to them to like, probably cleanse themselves from some sin and just to kind of get a little bit more spiritual and more holy and to avoid. So there's different rules with that when it comes to anything that, that's of the vine and it comes to, you know, withholding uh, these different things like, like that, you know, not drinking wine or grapes or anything like that. Anything that grows of the vine, you can't have that. And then they also would let their, their hair grow while they're separated, days of their separation. But then they end up shaving all that off and that gets thrown into the fire and is burnt up with their sacrifice. So this whole process is not meant to be like how you live your life. It was a very specific set. And all of the offerings and sacrifices are symbolic of the ultimate sacrifice that was made. And they're symbolic of... Uh, you know, our sins being purged and things like that. Well, if it's a shame for a man to have long hair, you know, you look at Jesus Christ as a representation of, of sa many sacrifices. Well, he bear the, the shame of our sin when he hung on the cross. So you can apply that shame as going on Christ for us to, to sanctify us and to cleanse us from all sin. Right? There's, there's, re there's more reasons behind this. Like I said, I don't really have time to, to really dig into all of that because I spent too much time uh, already on 1 Corinthians 11. But look into that for yourself and, and just reasonably think about it and look at it and say, oh, okay, yeah, I mean, this is, has these very clear rules about just being completely separated before you shave off all the hair and move on. So the Nazarite vow is a unique case, but it's not about like, oh, this is what you need to do in your life. There was a, a starting point, an end point. The hair kind of marked how long that was going to be or by, by how long it grew. But I want to get into this story about Absalom because this is another illustration of the truth found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that's found in a story with Absalom. 2 Samuel verse 14 verse 25 the Bible says this, but in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he pulled his head, for it was at every year's end that he pulled it, because the hair was heavy on him, therefore he pulled it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. Now, I, I looked up before the sermon how much 200 shekels is and it says after the king's weight so there's a little uh well what is the king's weight is it the same as the other weight measurements are used? i don't know but just a i mean if we're just looking at this say well what kind of what are we even talking about here right if it was the regular shekel weight that's known and standardized it would be like five to six pounds now obviously if the king's weight was a little bit different maybe it'd be a little bit less okay two pounds i i saw anywhere from two to six pounds it's a lot of hair, man, <laughs> right? No matter how you slice it, it's just, I mean, it's just a lot of hair. And of course, the commentaries are all saying like, well, this could very easily just be a, a, a scribal error because there's just so many errors with recording of numbers. It's like, don't listen to that garbage, okay? Yep. I stumbled on the comment. I wasn't looking up commentary on this. I just wanted to know what the shekel weight was and I stumbled on it and there's just all these fools saying like, well, this could just be an error. Like, it's not an error. It's put in the Bible for a reason, okay? Apparently, Absalom just had, I mean, look at all these attributes of him, though. It says, like, how he was beautiful, and there's no blemish in him. So he's just a really handsome guy, right? He's just someone that had this, this natural beauty. 
and and was was someone who was also I believe in this at least in this case kind of being symbolizing even Satan himself. Satan was a was an angel of light, and he was a very beautiful creature. But what happened is, you know, Satan wanted to be God. And here in this story, we see Absalom, what does he want? He wants to be the king. He's the son of the king, but that's not good enough for him. He wants to be the king. He wants to have that power. And here he is. He's all beautiful. He's got these locks and his hair just flowing and growing. And the only reason he's shaving his head once a year is just because it's just heavy. And now look, if you've got like five pounds of hair on your head, that is going to be kind of heavy, right? Like, man, let me unburden this stuff. But, he, but apparently he doesn't care about the honor to the head, right? Dishonoring his head, dishonoring Christ, or even dishonoring his father, right? The king. He doesn't care about that. We see his plot then. He steals the heart to the people in chapter 15, verse 5. The Bible reads, and it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. So instead of, just, you know, people are showing a respect and obeisance to him because he's, he's the king's son. He's just like, no, 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 come here, brother. You know, like, like embracing him and kissing him and, and trying to, to just say, no, no, we're, you know, like we're equal, we're all the same. And, and people love that. So he's, he's, he's saying things and doing things just with the intent of getting them to like him. Not that he actually cared about the people. He's just, he just wants to win them over. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So they're going to the king for judgment, for justice, for, for, for righteousness, to be delivered, to be executed. And then Absalom's getting in the way and intercepting them and greeting them this way. It says, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And he's basically telling everyone, well, you know, if I were king, like, basically, I'd rule in your favor. You know, like, I'd hear your matters, and I wish I could do that, not, you know, and just getting people to be like, oh, yeah, absolutely. If, you, if he was this guy, then everything would be great. And that's how Satan works, too. Trying to plant these seeds of doubt and, and plant their discontent with God and, and plant all this, this uh, desire to not want to be under the rule of the righteous king, but to do things Satan's way. And then it's no surprise, it's no coincidence, it's not by accident that we see the demise of Absalom in chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 9, when there's this big war, Absalom comes to try to fight and defeat David. It says, And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak. And he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. So he's on his mule, riding through the forest, and all of a sudden his head gets stuck in a branch. And the mule walks away, so he's just left like hanging there by his head. Now it says his head, it doesn't say his hair. But come on, why, why did it tell us about his hair? How is that relevant to the story at all, except where we see it coming back to bite him in the end? Going like, yeah, I think his hair probably had something to do with him getting stuck in that tree. And this hair that's a symbol of his pride, the hair that's, that goes to the, the heart of his rebellion against his authority, against the king, now is his destruction. Now is his downfall. And, you know, those that want to dishonor their head, especially if your head is Christ, Christ doesn't put up with that. It will be your downfall. Now, there's a few verses I want. Turn, if you would, to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I wanted to cover more in depth on what the Bible talks about here, other than just 1 Corinthians 11. Obviously, 1 Corinthians 11 is a primary passage. It really tells us a lot about how it's more than just like God caring about like, the exact length as if you had like a ruler or, or you know, some type of measuring stick to measure how long it is. It just has to do with your spirit and, and the honor that you would give to your head, whether your head is your father, your husband, whatever. It's, it's where your heart, it's going to show where your heart is. You're showing that outwardly, just like the world will tell you, you are, you are exhibiting a lot about yourself through your hair. 
And now we're going to look at a few verses that specifically will talk about women and their adorning of their hair. Um, and this is why I made reference to it at the beginning of the sermon. Look at verse number 9 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. The Bible says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So this is all helping to define modest apparel because modesty, we have a tendency to just think about modesty in, in terms of like things that would appeal to the lust of a man, right? If someone were to look at a, at a woman that has a really low cut dress, they would say that's immodest. And it's true, that is immodest. But modesty goes way farther beyond that. It's more than just the really short, revealing type of outfits. It just has to do with the attention being put on you. So whether that attention is put on you because of the amount of skin you're showing or because of the amount of gold you're wearing or because of how fancy your hair is or because of any of these other reasons, you know, it's listening, listening here, gold, pearls, costly array, how fancy, you all of that is immodest because you're drawing this attention to yourself. And the Bible teaches that the woman ought to be uh, in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety and not someone that's going to be the center of attention and not someone who needs all eyes on them. That's not their role, right? If anyone's the center of attention, it's going to be the man. And that's just the way that God made it. And, you know, a lot of men don't even want to be the center of attention. I don't like being the center of attention, but it's more the man's job than it is the woman's. Because men are leaders. And that's the way that God designed it. And women are supposed to be a help and to, to support the man. And that's the way God designed it. But it says here, so this is what, you know, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Say, you know what, women? What God cares about, what God wants to see is your good works. Just being godly, doing good things. Not caring as much about that external appearance, but the internal appearance of a meek and quiet spirit, like it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, which uh, I'll read in just a second. And then it says in verse 11, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And I just read that because it mentions the hair, and then it mentions the, the submission, right? 1 Corinthians 11, it mentions the head, it mentions the respect of the head, which is the man, and then... It, it, it talks about the hair, right? So it's, it's that linking of the two. We see the two being connected in another passage of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3, you could turn there, and I'll read for you an example of a godly woman. We see another one in 1 Peter chapter 3, but in John 12, verse 3, we see the story of Mary, where the Bible says that it took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the order of the ointment. So, we have a woman here that, that humbled herself so much that an attribute and, and the hair that's given her as a glory and, and women who care so much about their hair in general, she was willing to use her hair to wipe Jesus' feet. That's humility. That is the expression and the sign of someone who really is submissive and, and, is, and is godly to be able to humble themselves that much to be able to wipe Jesus' feet with her hair. That doesn't mean you have to go around washing people's feet with your hair, okay? But this is that expression of, of how, where her heart is in the right place, right? Her heart's right, and, that, and that's where your heart should be, women, to be able to say, you know what, if Jesus were here, I'm willing to get down on my knees and, and, and scrub his feet with my hair and kind of have that view of how important is that really. It's like, but I just got it done. <laughs> First Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 1, the Bible says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they, may, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, it, it's, no, it's no surprise we see the reference to the subjection to your own husbands and that submissiveness being brought up here because as we continue, we're going to also see a reference to the hair. The two go hand in hand. 
the, the, the respect to the head, to the authority, and the hair length, or in the, in the hair, go hand in hand. Verse number two, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. It, do you notice it brings it up again? If you're sitting there going, Pastor Burns, why do you have to keep on talking about this? I'm reading the scripture, yeah. right? Check your heart if you're really angry about hearing this. And I mean that sincerely. Like, check your heart. If, if it makes you angry to hear as a wife that you're supposed to be in subjection to your husband, your heart's not right. It isn't. It simply isn't right. And I'm not just trying to harp on this and hound on this. I'm literally showing these various examples from Scripture. We're going from Scripture to Scripture to point out the connection. There's no other agenda here other than just to teach the Word of God and to highlight this is consistent. This teaching is found here. And there's plenty of other passages I'm not going to. But these ones highlight that connection between the hair and the role of the authority and being in subjection to that role. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So Sarah is also brought up as another example of a godly woman. Why? Because she was in subjection to her husband and called him Lord and referred to him as her authority, her boss, whatever, right? That's how she uh, communicated with him and that's how she thought of him because her heart was right. And it doesn't say this in scripture, but based on her, at least I don't think it does, never really looked to see um, she's listed here as an example. It was just talking about, I doubt Sarah had like really short hair. She didn't act like it, that's for sure. I mean, she's exhibiting all the traits of someone who cares to bring glory and honor to her head, which as we read the story of, of Sarah and Abraham, she does bring honor and glory unto Abraham, right? And she's not perfect, no one is, but we see the image of someone who is uh, cares about the authority structure that God has put in place. It's a real simple topic when, when you think about it. Real basic. God likes putting a difference between men and women. I brought this up last week. We're different. God made us different for very good reason. For reasons we should all be able to shout amen about, right? Men are different and women are different from each other. Amen. Amen. This world is nuts. <laughs> How you could not appreciate being like being a man that God created women, or vice versa, right? Being a woman, appreciate that God made it men. Like women don't want effeminate men, and men don't want masculine women. It's just the way that God made it. So embrace, embrace. How God made you. If he made you a man, be manly. Don't walk around with a hairstyle that people are going to mistake you for a woman. And if you're a woman, be feminine. Embrace it. Have that, 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 that great ornament and, and that, that, that high value in God's eyes that he created women to have and, and, and fill the role that is an extremely important role, by the way, of being that helper and supporter that, that is invaluable to men to be able to accomplish the things in this life that God has for you, especially husbands and wives, your one flesh, that God has joined together to do a great cause and work for him. And when people are filling their roles, men and women equally in their specific roles, the most will get done for the Lord. So, you know, it's crazy to even have to spell these things out as much as we do these days. But here we are, right? 
as God's people, understand what the Bible says, be able to defend what the Bible says against a, such a perverted and wicked world that we live in. Let's pray as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instruction from Scripture. I pray that you would please, um, I pray that, that uh, if there's anybody who, who hears this sermon, they'd take it, uh, take the truth from your word out of it and be able to apply it in their life if it's, if it's uh, needed, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us all to be mindful of these things and that we would stand on even the most basic things of creation, of male and female, and that we would um, just love the way that you made us, dear Lord, and, and help us to not be uh, corrupted or, or polluted by the world's philosophy and the ever-changing um, societal norms that are out there, but that we would just trust in your word. And uh, Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.